Mr. Hornby has uh, exited the room in studio still, donning fedoras. Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney Matt Harvey, New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap, and West Virginia Senate President Craig Blair. You guys all fit in like a club, don't you? Do, do not adjust your dial. <laughs> this is real. There's three fedoras. There on are your three TV screen three room. men in this room with a sense of fashion, <laughs> and only three There's with a sense outsider. of fashion. Remember that band from the '80s, Men Without Hats? I would just be Man Without Hat. This is a whole different experience without the headphones. It's really, it's, it's kind of weird. It Really is, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So it's freeing. It's freeing. <laughs> so I'm going back. <laughs> For the record. Mine was in the truck talking right here. I was asked to go get it. <laughs> Mr. Blair, good morning to you. Good morning. How are you today? I am well. Uh, yesterday. Good morning to your listeners. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, yesterday, Senate President, uh, sorry, S- Senator Carnes was on talking about you, the Senate President, in not so glowing terms in regards to his ouster from the uh, Republican caucus. He uh, was vehement in the sense that he. Uh, said he did nothing wrong to be voted out. It was not uh, he who leaked any information, and that this is all part of a grander scheme of vendetta that you have against him. You got a question? No, just making an <laughs> opening statement. Okay. O- well, opening th- statement. First of all, let me t- uh, explain something for your listeners at this point in time, and, and to you guys in this room. And that is, is my responses will be somewhat limited of on this for several reasons. Of the the first one is respecting the caucus process, uh, and, and I probably need to exp- uh, explain that. The caucus process is a closed door meeting where people can say and have thoughts on whatever it may be, and you have that discussion, and of uh, it makes it so that you get a much much better conversation, and this this is normal of uh, f- from that standpoint. And the next one is is that of limited response uh, because there could be future repercussions of that are brought forward, and I don't want to undermine that, uh, whether it's within the legislative process or whether it be in the judicial process on what we're dealing with with Senator Carnes. So, Fair it, it, it it is what it is. I can tell you that a lot of things that were said yesterday weren't true and i didn't listen to the whole show to this point i have not listened to the whole show from yesterday but i was on to i had to go on to a call Mm -hmm. and i listened to that and you know for instance when you guys got to talk and debate the um ethics complaint against me because i was making too much money and that was uh i texted you and said that was months ago that that was settled and you can read between the lines on that you know, because the senator said that well he had never received anything well he didn't file the complaint but i assure you that he was well aware that they dismissed everything because there was nothing to there nothing the charges and he made them yesterday were that you were padding your mileage stats because you folks get mileage if you live far enough away you get a mileage reimbursement when you commute back and forth to the capital that you were working days you put down that you were working days that you weren't actually working so you were getting paid on a per diem basis more than you deserved as well that is not even remotely accurate and the reason for it is is that uh, by statute I could pay or to say that I could be paid 365 days a year And that is not the case. There are many days. In fact, last Tuesday, while we were in the interims, my meeting got canceled down there. And that means that if my meeting was canceled, I don't get paid. you got to be able to show up to a meeting. And I had meetings all day long, but there was no official meetings there. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty certain that I'm not going to get paid. The week before, I actually had to drive to Charleston twice. You're only allowed one time for that. Now, there was a time here, it was, I guess, the end of this year when they were, or the end of the session, and I was on this show, and I hadn't been home for a long time, and I thought that I hadn't been back or you know i didn't go home through the session and when you get to the end of it you're doing everything i hadn't been home for five weeks but there was a couple weeks i actually did go home and i got paid for that Mm -hmm. of but there is nothing of to where i'm overcharging state government if anything they're getting a great deal 
because we're down there. We're doing the, the, the ever present on making sure that things move right along in the state of West Virginia, the economic development, the preparing for the upcoming sessions, solving problems for the people of West Virginia and being proactive instead of reactive. So th th it's, it's not accurate. And it, this is all about uh, people wanting to be in power and perceive power, let's put it that way, uh, because I serve at the will of the caucus. And everybody needs to understand that too. Uh, when uh, somebody calls me corrupt, they're actually calling the caucus corrupt. And the reason for it is, is the members corrupt. Uh, the, the, and the reason for that is at any given point in time, they can say, we want a new Senate president. We want you out. We believe you're corrupt. That is not the case at all. They all know me. They know me well. The v people here in the Eastern Panhandle know me well. I say what's on my mind. I tell it straight, and it's hard pressed for you. To, you can't find where I've intentionally lied to anybody about anything. That's not going to happen. He mentioned. I uh, brought up the Ethics Committee investigation of those charges, which uh, the Ethics Committee cleared you of. And then his response was, "Well." The Ethics Committee has no teeth, and who do you think appoints those Ethics Committee members? The Senate President does. No, I don't appoint those. Uh, they, they go through uh, a process. What is um, uh, there's a committee in the Senate of uh, that, that actually approves, and we do that for everything, including the governor's cabinet secretaries. That's a normal process. The Senate President doesn't appoint. The ethics committee, that's not accurate either. I, th I think he, he, I think what he said was, and I did listen to it, that they're funded by the legislature, the ethics commission. I thought he also made reference to the fact maybe. that he said, well, who do you think appoints those those folks? I think he did say that. I, I can't maybe. remember that yeah. for sure. Uh, the last but, part I wanted to bring to your but, attention, Craig, was the allegation of uh, selling access to the Senate, that he accused you of selling access to the Senate. Not accurate again. Uh, and it's not even close to being accurate, for that matter. Access is available to anybody that has a good idea or a bad idea, and they come in and they talk to our caucus. And that's exactly what we were doing the previous Saturday, <coughs> excuse me, we've got a session that's coming up. We've got books put together all year long after the session's finished. We sift through what didn't make it through the process and what should still make it through the process so we get that put together. Then we look at new issues. We look at what other states are doing and saying, will this work to the benefit of the people of West Virginia? Then we go through that. Now, we have of lobbyists that have issues, too. They represent various organizations, whether it's health care, whether it's business. Uh, the, the list goes on on that. Uh, that come through and say, we need to change this or we need to change that so that we could do things different. So, inviting them in to the caucus of, to be able, and they got 10, 15 minutes, whatever it may be, it helps streamline the process. When you've got the vast majority of the caucus there, what happens is is that instead of them running around from one room to or office to the next, what they're able to do is come in and tell us what they're looking at for this upcoming session. Then questions are being able to be asked back. And questions get asked that I would never think about asking, but I get to hear the response on what's going on and then we collectively determine is this something that we want to do is this not something that we want to do and that comes back to where we're meeting at 7 30 in the mornings every morning everybody thinks it's a big party that's not the case at all these people work hard of uh, down there and think about having to be at a morning meeting at 7 30 in the morning that means that you got to be up at 5 30 at 6 o'clock and then this is repeated day in, day out. That is going to change a little bit this year. And that is Senator Bowley, who is 85-plus years old, and she's wonderful. She 
brings a lot of institutional knowledge. One of the original Republicans in the Senate, right? She, which was <laughs> the only Republican at one point in time, and there was 33 Democrats. Right. And uh, But I've been wanting her to run again because institutional knowledge is a key component of on knowing what's happened before, and she carries a wealth of that, and her mind is sharp. She is really good at what she does. And she's been hesitant on whether she wanted to run again or not. And uh, when we were having dinner that night, and it was a, we had a Christmas dinner too, and celebrate. It was her birthday for that matter. And we celebrated her birthday for, of two at that point in time. So there was a lot, multitude of things mm -hmm. that took place there. But um, she have actually uh, sent word to me that if we moved the morning caucus to 8.30, that she would run again. And I, t I told everybody, this is how a power play is done. <laughs> <laughs> of like, hey, and the caucus voted on it and everything. So we're going to be moving to 8.30, and we'll adjust our calendar accordingly so that we can still get all the work done. And I'll have to tell you, a guy that's 64 years old, and I know that I've worked 12 and 14 hours a day, of down there that it catches up with you <laughs> so 8 30 is not that unappealing of and we've already sort of changed the strategy uh for this that the 7 30 meeting will probably still take place but what we're hoping to do is to do it with the house of delegates and some of their leadership team and some of the senate's leadership team that where we can talk about who's running what and have an efficiency in the process I haven't spoken to the speaker about this yet but i'm pretty confident that he might go right along with that so that, because what we're doing is trying to do the best things for the people of west virginia john gilstrap yeah um yesterday senator carnes um mentioned that uh the the note that was allegedly leaked that he, he allegedly leaked to the blogger whose name I forget Tom Roden Tom Roden um, that Roden came has has said no I that's he was not the person I got this from and that the the Senate knows that that uh, Senator Carnes did not do the thing that he was accused of this is him speaking oh, what do you say to that I don't believe that Senator Carnes is accurate, and once again, I don't know whether that I, – I'm not going to go too far into that except for when the caucus of decided to remove him from the caucus with a two-thirds vote. Of What is the practical consequence of that, by the way, of, of being expelled from the caucus? The practical consequence is, is that you're not in – having the discussions in the morning over what's going on on the agendas and stuff like that. I'll make sure that he has uh, the booklet that we have. Uh, we put something together every day that tells us what's going on and all that. That won't be kept from him from that standpoint, but the disruption of will cease. Remember day 59 of when he was on the floor and saying that one of the bills read in their entirety, even though they'd already been read in their entirety three times in the House and three times in the Senate. But the funny part about it is, is the next day he comes back to the floor. And by the way, I made the right call on that. Of uh, The caucus, or the, the members of the Senate wanted to remove him from the Senate entirely. Two-thirds of the members that do that, you're out. You're no longer a senator. And I said, no, that's not the right thing to do. We're not going to do that. And uh, they listened to me, and we went on for that. And that's not – they could have overrode me on that, but they understand that I have institutional knowledge too and that my heart's in the right place on doing the right thing of, in that chamber of for the people of West Virginia. And you do, let's not forget – it was just a couple months later, if that, in Nashville, where they removed those three members down there, and it was the wrong thing. They didn't do it. And I was in Nashville at the time when that was happening. I said, somebody should have called me up to say, you, you, you do these things in steps at a time. You give chances for people to get right and to get better at what they're doing. I know I digressed away from my answer to you. Of, but you still get the, the understanding, the listeners will get the understanding that we're not in the business of making it so that you just throw somebody out 
for no reasons. And then when we had the special session this year, we suspended rules over and over and over. I think it was like 50 or 60 times that we suspended the rules so that we weren't there for three days in the Senate, three days in the House, driving up the cost. That time, Senator the Senator Carnes voted to suspend those rules each and every time. So, you know, you can't have it both ways. It was theater, theater to be disruptive to the process, and that's why he got removed that day of four, and then he was back in the next day. So it's whatever spin that he can put on things to try to cast me in a negative light. Mm, go for it. This, <clears throat> this feels very personal, um, certainly from him toward you, and, and I, I don't want to get into stuff that is inherently personal and, and none of my business, but one of the accusations he leveled at you dealt with essentially your politics, that you are a Republican in name only, where you should be uh, putting out conservative, you should be espousing conservative principles. You are, in fact, doing a lot of liberal things. And he did not, he, there was no definition of, of what he's talking about. Of course any, not. Any ideas? Oh, d d d ideas on that? Of what, d either on that it, or what he might be talking about. See, here's where the problem arises. And that is, is that when you are an elected official of defamation, is a very, very high threshold. So you can actually lie and make t t all kinds of allegations, and it's almost impossible to have any type of repercussion on that. Look, when we were dealing with the abortion process, and there was members, and Senator Carnes was one of them, even though he sort of alluded yesterday that he was not, that of when it comes to the abortion, that there was people, there was members that wanted no exceptions, none, of uh, for this. And but there was the over there was way more members that wanted exceptions for date res, rape, incest, and the life of the mother. And Craig Blair, of d repeated over and over to the caucus, that our goal here, more than anything at this point in time, because it got thrusted upon us pretty quickly of on this is to close the abortion clinics. We have been successful, very successful. You can want to call me a rhino. Four, over 400 abortions were taking place a year. And at this point in time, at this year, when I last heard it, it was like seven or eight that has taken place. And those could have been for rape and incest or the life of the mother. So that's not being a rhino. This is accusations that's unfounded. We've run we've got the most one of the most conservative abortion bills there is in the country. When it comes to transgender, some of the most conservative. But you also have to keep in mind that Craig Blair is not the caucus chairman, that's Senator Eric Nelson. Most of the time when I go into caucus, I lean back in the chair and I count votes. So that can I can count votes by listening to the discussion. It is not hard to tell where people are at. And then I'm able to help facilitate the process and know what's going on. And if the caucus wants something done and a chairman doesn't, the chairman's going to do it because that's where Craig Blair comes into play. And I will say, no, the caucus is wanting this done. You are going to run the bill. And I have done that before because there, there's a difference on that. But what happens is that you can have a minority that wants something done and it's not there, then they get upset because they're not getting their way. And it, let's go back to Robert doesn't seem to play well in the sandbox. And uh, when I say that is, is that we've all been in classrooms in school and it's a big issue right now that you've got one student that's disruptive. And it's, it's, it's taking down the rest of the class, the learning experience, the productivity that you can have in the classroom. And uh, God bless Senator Amy Grady, uh, who's the education chair now. And uh, we're working on a plan right now to be able to take those disruptive students in the classroom out and put them in a, a, a safe place, so to speak, 
with video cameras, with specialists, to be able to monitor that on, on what's going on and letting the classroom environment go back to the learning process, giving the teachers the ability to do what they're hired to do, what they're called to do, and that is to teach the students rather than teaching down to the lowest common denominator. Very, very similar situation on what we're dealing with in our caucus from that standpoint. And I'm telling you right now that I couldn't dictate of uh, to the caucus to do anything. They, they, my job is, is to facilitate their will and make sure that they're educated with the accurate facts because you can't make good decisions on bad information. I bet you that I have said that statement on this show a dozen times. And it's very important that you do, you have that. And it's important for lobbyists. If you do not have your credibility, whether you're a lobbyist, they can be very advantageous, it, or whether you're a member, or whether you're a staff, it's somebody that works for us, the staff. If you are not credible in what the information that you provide, you are useless. And when you become useless, you become irrelevant, and then... You, you, put, you put yourself into a situation where you can't get things done. There's a, I, I will use another term, too, and Eric Tarr uh, coined this term. It's called counter-conservative. And that is, is and when you're a counter-conservative, that means that you got to have 100% your way all the time on everything. And what ends up happening is if you associate yourself to a given issue, lots of times it kills that issue, and it makes it so that it doesn't get done. And so you you, you got to be able to work together. The politics is a team sport, and there is a group out here that is saying that it's a full contact sport, and that's false. That's not true at all. Good ideas can come from any place. You have to be smart enough to listen to them smart enough to be able to deploy them and get them to where they're providing benefit to our people in West Virginia. And there's no denying that West Virginia over the last seven, eight years is far exceeding the previous four decades of, and we can see that happening, the investment, the improvements, and but there's still much work to be done. Craig, we are uh, out of time. Thanks for coming in today. Appreciate it. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Can I have one more thing? If you can do it in 10 seconds. Yes. I was at James Rumsey yesterday, and that's where I went to school at to learn a lot of the trades. And th th they've got it going on out there. It was an exciting day. Go look at my Facebook page. I'll put some stuff up on that. Thank, Thank you, Thank you. Thanks for coming in today.